Ok. Mesdames, Messieurs, veuillez accueillir Angel Gouria, secrétaire général de l'OCDE, et Alvaro Santos Pereira. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Secretary General of the OECD, Angel Gouria, and Alvaro Santos Pereira, the Acting Chief Economist. You know, uh, in uh, rock concerts, uh, there's a warming up number, you know, so, so somebody comes up first and they warm up the crowd and then comes the, uh, the main attraction. So I'm, I'm playing that role today. Um, thanks for joining us for the presentation of our latest economic outlook. Pleased to report that our central scenario for the world economy is more favorable than it has been for many years. Global GDP growth in 2018, 2019, will be close to 4%. This is similar to pre-crisis averages, but in per capita terms, actually about half a percentage point better. Job gains are also strong. Unemployment across the OECD is approaching its lowest levels since 1980. And the growth of trade and business investment has rebounded, while inflation is moderate. Now, this, uh, this is all welcome news. It's good news. There are, however, a number of challenges, even in this positive scenario, for many households Real disposable income is still lower than before the crisis, and stubbornly weak wage growth is fueling social discontent. Only limited improvements are seen in some of these areas. And when I mean limited, it means localized. They're happening in some countries. The rise in trade tensions is already dented business confidence in some places, and it would have more severe consequences if some of the announced measures and countermeasures are actually taken. The recent surge in oil prices, the price of a barrel of Brent has actually increased by 50% in the past year, has in part reflected uncertainty about supply and demand issues, fundamental issues, but also some geopolitical tensions. So a continuation of that rise would put upward pressure on inflation at large. Related risk is that if inflation surprises on the upside, then monetary policy could be tightened further and faster than people are expecting. This could be particularly disruptive in economies where house prices are high and or where households are already very heavily indebted. And the evidence in this outlook of the growing interconnection of our economies is a reminder that policy actions in one major country are more than ever likely to be felt strongly in the rest of the world. And that goes to the heart of the Ministerial Council meeting, whose theme is, of course, the refoundation of multilateralism, or rather, to be precise, the reshaping of the foundations of multilateralism, la refondation du multilateralisme. And all these risks have policy implications. For example, with most OECD economies now having an expansionary fiscal stance. What is it, Alvaro, about two-thirds or maybe 70 percent? Three quarters of our member countries at the OECD are having some kind of stimulus measures. Some of them more modest, some of them more open, uh, but basically you're talking about policies supporting the recovery. So um, we, of course, are calling caution on 
overly pro-cyclical policies. This would worsen upward pressure on inflation. It would worsen upward pressure on interest rates, could yield large exchange rate movements, all of which could trigger financial instability. We also think that central banks should guard against overreacting as inflation nears or reaches their own target levels, their own bands, as they are called practically in every country. In current conditions, unexpectedly rapid tightening, when talking about monetary policy, which means basically putting interest rates up, could trigger sharp falls in asset prices. And uh, it could also trigger a surge in bad debts because people will no longer be able to pay their debts at the new uh, higher variable rates. Now, this would look like a greater danger to the world economy than an overshooting which would, you know, keep interest rates longer at their present uh, lower level or than going up the interest rate scale uh, a little, with a little slower, you know. So um, uh, let's, let's keep that in mind today. The current outlook is a reminder that across much of the world, achieving satisfactory growth seems to require policies that are highly supportive of demand. But these policies encourage a ratcheting up of debt levels and they encourage overinflated asset prices, all of which can sow the seeds of future crises. In many of our economies, we need to find a better, more sustainable way of achieving satisfactory economic growth. I say we are still on, you know, on some kind of crutches, on some kind of support system. And what we're saying is it's not yet moving by itself, on its own, with its own dynamic. So you'll not be surprised to learn that for us, much of the answer has to come from better structural policies, structural change. Unfortunately, overall, this is not what we are seeing. When we measure structural reform actions against our own OECD recommendations, we actually find a negative trend in recent years. And why are we insisting on this? Well, simply because we're running out of monetary policy room, we're running out of fiscal policy room. The question then is, well, what about structural policy? And those changes, those reforms that are going to allow us to keep the growth going in the medium and long term basically are slowing down. There is a sort of reform fatigue and there is a sort of, you know, well, the, 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 the political economy of economic policy is kind of creeping into the proceedings and uh, slowing reform down. So we have to step up reforms, particularly in a context of fiscal easing in most of our countries. The outlook underlines the need for tax and spending measures to be conducive to strong inclusive and sustainable growth. It urges countries to boost investment in education and skills, recommends improvements to digital and physical infrastructure. Now the other main message in the economic outlook is the one with the greatest resonance for the Ministerial Council meeting. The special chapter looks at how economies have become more exposed to developments abroad as a result of growing international economic integration. It highlights that the impact of external shocks, especially from emerging economies, has become stronger. For example, a few decades ago, global factors accounted for roughly about half of the equity price movements in advanced economies. And now we believe they determine about 90% of the changes in equity price moments. So the chapter notes that increased economic integration raises challenges for policy. On the domestic policy side, 
countries should try to strengthen their resilience to external shocks. Along with structural reforms to that end, improved social safety nets are needed to ease adjustments to global, channel, uh, to global changes. Another implication is that the need for international policy coordination is greater than ever. If we are more sensitive to what is happening in other countries, in other places, then of course it requires that the policy coordination becomes even greater in order to avoid you know, the turbulence. Establishing effective global standards, global rules, along with continued multilateral dialogue is the best means of bringing that about. And this, of course, resonates with the theme chosen by President Macron for this year's MCM, as I mentioned, la refondation de multilateralism. So, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, ministers, excellencies, over the next two days, ministers will discuss how to strengthen the foundations of multilateralism, how to reshape the foundations of multilateralism to achieve more inclusive and sustainable outcomes. I hope that the messages of this economic outlook will be in the forefront of their minds. The world economy is at last doing better, finally doing better. It took 10 years to get to where we are today. But not everyone is benefiting from that improvement. And there are some important risks to the baseline scenario, including the risk of the multilateral system being weakened. So, dear friends, I now hand over to Avaro Pereira, who will take you through the main findings of the report in greater detail. Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Uh, Bonjour. Uh, this is the economic outlook, the new economic outlook in, uh, in, uh, in English. Uh, we also have it in uh, French and we also have it in Espanol. And we have it also in, in, in German. Uh, I would like to start by thanking all my teams and all the teams across the OECD that contributed to the economic outlook, in particular the desks and uh, the division headed by Sven Blondel that uh, was able to make this, uh, con this contribution. L'économie mondiale Global, the global economy is, uh, has reached a growth rate of 4%. Uh, uh, it's uh, historic uh, pre-crisis average. Uh, this is uh, very good news. Uh, the growth is driven uh, by uh, trade and investment, but economic policies are also important. The Secretary General just said, finally gearing towards 4%. The good news also show that uh, we have investment and trade rebounding. This is good news because we've been waiting for this for many years. Very often we had conferences, discussions to see where's investment? Where's the investment coming from? And now we see investment not only in Europe, but we see investment in countries like India rebounding fairly strongly. The same thing with trade. Trade last year grew at 5.2%, uh, and this year we think that trade is going to grow at a healthy rate around 4.5, 4.7%. But what is interesting is, even though we are welcoming uh, the investment and trade rebound, this is just not enough to explain the 4%. So what does explain, what can help also explain the 4% growth rate of the economy? And the answer is policy. First, in the last few years after the crisis, the central banks use what, what the economists like to call unconventional monetary policy, so strong uh, um, uh, measures to boost the credit and to boost the economy, lowering interest rates, for example. And so, for a long time, monetary policy was the only game in town. Now, what we are showing, that, as, the, as we just saw, three quarters of the countries of the OECD right now are taking fiscal easing. They are either cutting taxes or increasing expenditures. So one of the messages you should take from this outlook is that fiscal policy is the new game in town. It's the new game in town, but also this brings risks, as I'll, I'll highlight later on, especially in the medium term related to inflation. The other message that I would like you to take away from this room is, and this is very good news, especially knowing that we had the largest crisis in our lifetimes. 
with historical peaks of unemployment, people losing their jobs, families losing their livelihoods. What we see is that we, we are witnessing very strong job growth. So strong that next year, we're going to have the lowest unemployment rate since 1980. Take this message with you, the lowest unemployment rate since 1980. This is very important because it shows that finally reforms are paying off. Policy is paying off and this is good news going forward. However, not everything is rosy, not everything is good news. We do believe that risks are looming large. We always highlight the risks, but this time we think that risks are looming large because uh, there's the risk of some financial volatility, the higher inflation also motivated by higher oil prices, and also trade tensions, which I'll come back later on. But again, going back to the message in terms of families, remember, you know, high debts led to greater debt after the crisis. And so that means a lot of families are vulnerable when interest rates start rising. They have to do their mortgage payments. And in a few years' time, they, their mortgage payments will be higher, which will give them less income for them to spend in other issues. If you, want to, if you need credit to buy a car, or in your credit card, you're going to pay higher interest payments. This will have an impact on consumption going forward and on real incomes. But also the same thing for corporations and for countries. This is very important to say that high debt means that, you know, with rising interest rates, you'll have less margin. And finally, I'll focus the attention on the reforms, need to do reforms, and if fiscal policy and monetary policy are doing their trick, structural policy is certainly not doing that trick. And I'm going to say that governments are not doing enough in terms of structural policy. So let me go through some graphics to explain what we mean. So first of all, this graph shows you the world growth of the world economy. So if you sum up all the columns, this is what you get. And you can see if we draw a line there, you know, it will be going up. You know, remember, just three years ago, when the OECD called for governments to do more about their fiscal spaces and use the fiscal spaces, growth was close to 3%. Now we're getting to clo growth close to 4%. And one thing that is quite important is to say that right now, in the, before but now even more, China and India contribute to 50%, half of world growth today and the next few years. The contribution of the Indian economy, because it's getting larger and it's growing fast, will increase. And you will see that the importance of the emerging market economies will continue to increase. But also, this picture shows that other economies, much as especially, especially the commodity producers, are also contributing to growth. The good investment story is this one. So, investment is rebounding. And in fact, what we like about investment is that investment is rebounding in machinery and equipment. We're talking about good investment. We're talking about business investment. Why is this good news? Because you know, the first quarter of the year was not so good. It was what the economists call a soft patch. So the indicators were not so good. We are not overly concerned about the soft patch because of this picture. Because investment in equipment and machinery shows that we probably will continue to have more investment in the future. Even though this is not spectacular. This is part of the, the reason we have to say that policy has to come. The other issue is trade. Trade has recovered from really low levels uh, three years ago and right now is getting towards about 5%. And you can see one of the indicators, global port traffic, which continued to rise, even though, again, with the soft patch, we slightly went down, but the trend is, is rising up. And this is the picture I told you before. One of the messages I would like you to get out of this room is that the new game in town is fiscal policy. This picture is telling you the green is fiscal easing, so which countries, the number of countries, these are number of countries, number of countries of the OECD that are doing fiscal easing, and you can see more and more green uh, right now. During 2011, 2012, during the big austerity years in Europe, you could see most OECD countries doing large fiscal tightening. Uh, few are, were doing small fiscal tightening, but it was a lot of tightening. Right now, it has completely reversed, and so that's why I say fiscal policy is new game in town, which brings challenges. Not all policy is the same, right? Some countries need to lower their corporate tax rate or to improve their tax mix, but other countries also need to use their fiscal policy to do some productivity enhancing measures. And I'll come back to that when I talk about the structural policies that we believe that are important to do, and also investing in the digital infrastructure to prepare the economies for uh, the new uh, you know, incoming uh, digitalization challenge. Job creation is strong, and so as I said, this is very important. However, you can see the underlying message is that job creation is strong, but it's still 
not good enough to bring everybody into the labor market. And look at the United States. The unemployment rate in the United States, we are forecasting to be 3.6% next year. Really low. Only in the mid-60s we had this low in unemployment rate. However, you can see also that the labor participation rate in the United States went down fairly dramatically in the last few years and has not fully recovered. So you can see this line, the dotted line tells you, you know, compares this where we were in the crisis and the United States, uh, you can see the employment rates are still lower than during the crisis. So more people can, bring brought, be, be, uh, can be brought to the labor market going forward. As a consequence of labor shortages, as a consequence of a uh, strong wage market, we are finally seeing something that, uh, again, is still very moderate. We're talking about 0.9% growth, but it's happening finally. And we're forecasting that wage growth will start rising slowly in some countries, partly motivated by higher productivity, but also partly because of labor shortages. And uh, it also because of policy. In Japan, for example, the Japanese government introduced a policy, a tax credit, if companies increase their wages, and we believe this will have an impact. So uh, wage growth is expected to go up, but moderate, uh, in a moderate. But as I said, risks loom large. Let's start with oil prices have risen 50% in the last 12 months. And what we're saying is, and we look at this graph, this graph tells you that why are oil prices going up? The reason is because demand, global demand, is outstripping supply so far. Okay? More supply is coming to the market, but right now global demand is outstripping supply and also because of geopolitical tensions. So we believe that, obviously, going forward, this might be an issue for some countries. Positive for commodity exporters, but not so positive for the others. We've seen in the last few weeks that because rising bond yields, rising interest rates in the United States are putting a lot of pressures in some emerging market economies. Let me just start to say that, first, emerging market economies are in much better shape than they used to be in the 90s. So they are a lot more resilient. Second, they are also in much better shape than they were in 2013 during the, uh, the so-called Tatum uh, Tantrum. Um, uh, and so what happens is that we have this volatility, and we see this is happening mostly in countries uh, that have had either external imbalances or internal imbalances, and or high inflation or high current account deficits, and this is putting, posing them to a vulnerable, uh, in a vulnerable position. And also, again, debt. The 800-pound gorilla in the room is debt. We've been forgetting that for a while. But now that interest rates are going back uh, up, it's important to say this will cause difficulties in the short run. Obviously, these are, this graph tells you, tells you about credit liabilities of corporations in several countries. One of the countries we've been worried about, and we've been saying this in our surveys, is China, in which uh, private debt is about 170% of GDP, and we believe that the actions that the government and the central bank has undertaken has had some impact to slow down credit growth, but it's important to continue to the leverage. This is a big risk going forward, so it's important to continue to the leverage and continue to have, take action for, to, to tackle private debt in China. Another thing that we, we, we highlight is how a shock to the world economy is much bigger now uh, than used to be. So look at our chapter two uh, and talks exactly about this. Uh, and what we're saying is that now if there's a shock, say a, a world trade shock, this will have much bigger impact than 20 years ago. This picture is telling you that basically exports plus imports used to be about 15% uh, of GDP, world GDP, 20 years ago. Right now it's 30%. The propagation of the shocks has a much bigger impact in the economies, even more because global value chains are much more complex than it used to be. And so this is a very important message going forward. So the, pic the picture is, and to conclude the part that of this presentation, so remember, for a while policy has done its job, 4% is good, but monetary policy will have to go back to normal, and normal is good. Fiscal policy is doing their job. What is missing in the picture? What is missing? Obviously, we have the OECD, but it's not only because we have the OECD. What you say is that what is missing is reforms are not happening. So you look at this uh, uh, picture from our Going for Growth publication. Basically, it tells you whether or not, the graph tells you whether or not countries are implementing reforms uh, that have been advocated uh, you know, and identified in the Going for Growth publication. And what this says is that in every single year since 2011, in every single year, the reform momentum has been dampened, has decreased. There are less ambition. 
There's less will to reform. There's less will to do the structural reforms the countries need to, to grow. And what we're saying is having an expansion based on monetary policy and fiscal policy is not sustainable. It will not last forever. So unless you act on the reforms, growth will peter out, will decrease dramatically. So the reforms part is very important. And I see here ministers that have undertaken very important reforms in their countries and that can give you their experience, how important, for example, Ministry of Economy of Mexico, how important the reform in Mexico's were exactly to, to make the Mexican economy uh, more resilient. In other countries, the same thing. The countries that have been more resilient are exactly the ones that are taking reforms. The big countries that are undertaking reforms in the last uh, couple of years were Brazil, Argentina, and India, the EMEs. The EMEs are doing their job. The OECD is not. Okay? Look at this. So one of the reforms that we think that is very important is regards skills and education. And so we look at vocational training, invest in, investing in uh, uh, you know, improving labor market needs uh, done by skills and vocational, and, and also lifelong learning. So our colleagues from the education department, the best world experts uh, in education, uh, they are showing, and our projections show that you know, in terms of skill, not, not enough has been done. Look at this here red. This picture tells you if reforms on skills on that area has been implemented is a green, and the rest is a red. This is a sea of red that should, you know, should not make us very happy. This sea of red means that governments are talking the talk of skills, and they're not walking the walk. They're not walking the walk. More needs to be done to invest in skills. More needs to be done to invest in education, because if we don't do this, we will not be able to address the labor shortages. We will not be able to deliver higher productivity for our, for our standards. We will not be able to make growth work for all. Other things that we think that has to be done is in terms of using fiscal instruments for inclusive growth and, and sustainability. So one thing that we think it's important is to use change the tax mix uh, to make it uh, better uh, for, for example, low-income low earners. Investing public investment uh, in, uh, increasing public investment in infrastructure, especially digital infrastructure. Or, for example, investing in early childhood education to give opportunities to, to, to kids for everybody um, uh, of different social st uh, status and social uh, 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 components. I think it's very important to invest in early childhood education and increase family and child allowances and subsidies for children. This is very important for us, for our children to have a future. No, no education, no future. So no skills, no future. And I think this is very important that your government should focus your, your attention in the next few years. And finally, I would like to end up the policy section with a message that I think is very important. Now that we hear virtually every day that Trade tensions are on the rise. There's an escalation of trade tensions. And there could be, you know, uh, some nasty scenarios going forward. Rather than talking about the nasty scenarios, what our trade colleagues in the, in the, in the TAD department said and did, uh, together with our uh, team in the economics department, they calculated using a general equilibrium model, what would be the impact if we reduce tariffs to the lowest level possible in every single product of the, uh, of the world, okay? So we calculate it. And even though tariffs are fairly low in many countries, the impact will be significant. A 3% increase in world trade if we decrease the tariffs. And what we're going to do in the next few years, in the next few months, will be to calculate, since tariffs are just a small component of, of barriers, we're going to calculate what will be the impact of non-technical barriers to trade. And if we reduce the barriers to services, and I can guarantee you, I would be absolutely surprised if we don't get a much bigger change than this. But what we're saying here is dialogue is essential, multilateralism is essential to de-escalate the trade tensions and to show that everybody benefits when we reduce barriers to services and goods, when we reduce tariffs so that we make trade work for all. Wrapping up, the picture is a good one and not so good one. Good one because the economy is certainly healthier than it used to be, but risks are looming large. We like the investment story, we like the trade story, but policy is doing, is kind of an overdrive policy, and this is not sustainable. The only way 
to sustain growth. You've heard the OECD saying this very often, but we also show this in specific areas, skills, uh, infrastructure, and so on. We give you specific recommendations. It's time to go back to reforms. It's time to give reforms a chance. It's time for us to reform, to improve skills, to improve education systems in order to be able to have higher productive, higher productive societies, but especially to make growth work for all. Thank you.